Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life program spring 2022 session. And this is a special one, it's our climate series. My name is Tracy Bowman, and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at the University of Manitoba and a very proud UM alum. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world and making this event part of your day. We're able to offer this program free for all of our alumni and friends around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, I am Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about the insurance options that they offer to UM alumni also on the UM, the UM alumni website. So please check that out if you're interested. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. You're all watching this via YouTube, which is being recorded. And so we do that so we're able to post the session so you can see it again and again. It will be posted to our website and we'll share that with you in a day or so. Uh, I encourage you to look at our other topics that we've been hosting over the last two years. We've got a lot of content, over 30 sessions, so please check those out as well on our website. In terms of asking questions of our speaker, there's two ways you can do that. Uh, if you've been with us before, you're familiar with our website that we use Slido, which is www.slido.com. And the password that you need to enter in order to ask questions is VLFL23. Now, if you'd rather not do that, you're able to ask questions right on YouTube in the chat function there, and we'll be look, going back and forth between either. So I really encourage you to ask lots of questions during uh, uh, during the session, and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can afterwards. Uh, so now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, today's presenter, who if you were participating in our fall 2021 program, you've heard from him before. It's Dr. Stefan Flugmaker Lima, and he will be speaking on the topic of water is life, how simple plants can contribute. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Flugmaker Lima is the Dean of the University of Manitoba's Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. He received his PhD from the University of Munich and served as a full professor of ecological impact research and ecotoxicology at the Technical University of Berlin. He's also a professor of aquatic ecotoxicology in an urban environment at the University of Helsinki, where he runs a joint laboratory of, of applied ecotoxicology with the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. He also holds ad administrative roles at the Technical University of Berlin and the University of Helsinki, in addition uh, to serving the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the German Research Foundation, the Lithuanian Research Council, and as an advisory board member of Cancer Research and Biotechnology AG in Switzerland. So that is quite an impressive bio. There's lots uh, that he's involved with, lots of many organizations and institutions. So with that, over to you, Dr. Flugmaker Lima. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me with you and for giving me the possibility to showcase a little bit what I'm doing in my research. And I'm uh, sharing the screen now for that. Um, going into the presentation mode. Did you see all that? Now we see it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So topic of today is water is life and what simple plant can do for us in, in that way. Um, but first, let me start with the traditional territories acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oi Cree, Dakota and Dene people and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So let's talk about water is life. And uh, during this talk, I will hit a little bit the topics of climate change on water use and misuse. Um, I will talk about mother nature and uh, these weird things, green liver and plant gills, um, and a little bit about my dream at the end. So let's start with that. Water is the base for all life on Earth. That's pretty clear. We are living on our blue planet and water is essential for all of what we are doing here and for all life organisms here. 
Um, 3% of all this water on Earth is fresh water. Even we have a blue planet, most of that is salt water. So we have only 3%, which is really usable for us at the moment. And 0.5% of all fresh water is instantly available for us. The rest is in ice caps, in permafrost, um, and bound to, to soil particles. So we have only 0.5%, and we should take care on the quality of this 0.5%. Um, otherwise, is that the future we are looking at? Um, of course, that's a picture from the internet, and it showcases a little bit what could happen with getting the world hotter and hotter due to climate change and the water getting less and less. And in some parts of the world, and um, when you when you in, for example, going to Africa, you can already see that uh, you have a, a soil and uh, a surroundings of lake and rivers like that. So what are the, the, the big issues with water uh, and climate change? First of all, we see flooding. And with flooding, of course, water contamination. And then, of course, when the water is contaminated, we have less drinking water. Remember the, the big floodings last year in Germany, which will which were also killing people on that. So that's that's what we never saw before and which happening more and more often. Then we see that the heat is, is, is there. Um, temperatures are rising. With that, we have algae blooms, which are uh, sometimes really toxic. Um, and also this uh, last summer, when I was uh, going bathing at Lake Winnipeg, I saw one day uh, after a little storm the day before, that there was an algae bloom of toxic cyanobacteria coming up. So all this is driven by heat, also the lower of the snowpack, which Mother Earth needs really to recover in the wintertime. And then we have the droughts, where crop damages can uh, happen, and this will, of course, shrinking our supplies. And on top of all this, we have the human influence. We have water contamination with chemicals, we have water use and misuse. And just remember when you when you go in the toilet, we are still flushing 10 liters of drinking water away. Um, so maybe compost toilets and gray water toilets would be an idea. And um, we have to examine whether this is possible and doable. So to keep in mind, access to water and sanitation is a human right on that. And you see that on the picture of the little boy. And when you go to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, you see these 17 goals. And two of them have to do with water. Um, clean water and sanitation, number six. And number 14, life below water. So from my very, very biased point of view, um, if we are not taking care on these two points, we can really forget some of the other goals of this um, plan because that have essentially to do with water. Um, and if we don't have clean water, there's no good human health. That's simple like that. And we have to understand that. Okay, if we would be in a lecture hall and lucky for you, we are not, I would make an experiment with you. I would give you this bottle of water, uh, one of them, you, um, and then I would ask you to just open it and to, to have a sip of that. Um, and then you would tell me how this water is tasting. Um, and I, I, of course, I would choose one of the best mineral waters you can have. And, and, and the answer might be, oh, this water is nice and tasty. Um, but I can tell you, this water is the same water a dinosaur was already peeing in. Um, of course, that was millions of years ago. And uh, the water is purified through Mother Earth, through uh, rocks and uh, plants, and, uh, and then ending up in, in, in water, which is again drinkable for us. But this picture should just remind you on that water on Earth is limited. It's, it's not getting more, um, and we really have to take care on the amount of water we have in our blue planet. Only Water can get more on Earth if we will be hit by an ice comet from outer space, bringing, bringing some more water in. But maybe that's not very good for our planet as well, hitting by a big comet. OK, um, I would like um, to cite Kofi Annan, the seventh secretary general of the United Nations from 1997 to 2006, also the 
holder of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001. Fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. That he was telling us in 2001 during one of his talks. So will we have water wars coming up in the future or do we already have water wars on that? Um, I'm talking about wars, please forgive me. Normally I would not do political statements in my presentation, but as a European and really um, being shocked what happens in Europe at the moment, I can only say war is never a solution and peace is the only answer, Mr. Putin. So for that, um, we have to protect our aquatic and riparian ecosystems and we need to understand them. Uh, we need to know how freshwater ecosystems will respond to future climate change, as well as changes in land use, uh, changes in pollution, pollution patterns, and in water demand. Um, in Europe, we have the European Water Framework Directive, which is based on river basins and uh, four innovative objectives. Uh, they are, for example, the central role of aquatic life, good water and ecosystem quality, public participation in water management activities, and the recovery of costs for water services. And all the main tool on that, there are several tools on that. The main tool is the River Basin Management Plan. So if you look at Canada, um, Canada might be good to have a Canadian Water Framework Directive. And I see with this establishment of the Canadian Water uh, Agency, that there are steps in that direction. And uh, my faculty and people in my faculty are giving hopefully valuable comments on how to set this up and how to run this. Let me cite Kofi Annan again. But the water problems of our world need not to be only a cause of tension. They can also be a catalyst for cooperation. This was 2002 and I was a young man during that time and thinking on what I can do to help with that. So I was just sitting down and learning from mother nature. So I'm a plant physiologist, a microbiologist and a biochemist from education. So I was looking at plants and at biotransformation. And actually what you see in this little cycle, these pathways and how chemicals are metabolized and transformed, that's my world. That's where I'm at home uh, and what I can do best, I think. So looking at pathways, how plants are transforming chemicals, metabolizing them and what they are doing with them afterwards. Biotransformation, that's uh, it is called. So this biotransformation and the same biotransformation happens in our liver is in three phases. Um, we have an activation phase and that means that the chemical entering a, a body um, is just put a red flag on it, mark it. And these are chemical processes like oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, and epoxidation. And they are doing nothing else than labeling this compound for phase two. And in phase two, that's a conjugation phase. That means we put in some cell internal components like glutathione, sugars, or amino acids to make these metabolites more water soluble, less uh, more water soluble means um, they can be transported better in a cell. They are most likely not bioaccumulating in fatty tissues. And in phase three, they can be excreted via urine and feces and then released from the body. That's the transportation phase. If you look at plants, plants can pretty do the same. They have similar enzyme systems, nearly the same enzyme system sometimes, and they can do exactly the same with excretion. They have quite of a bit of a problem. They can't go to the toilet, but um, they can do very much good storage in cellulose, hemicellulose and apoplast storage places, and they can do a further metabolite. So this is what I call a green liver system because it works exactly like our liver and I think green liver system. If, if you Google green liver system a few years ago, that would be a really, via chicken disease, um, coloring the liver of a chicken green. My research has nothing to do with that. My research has to do with plants and plants used as a green liver for purification of, for example, water. So let's see plants. 
Uh, and I can only tell you these are really wonderful things. Um, if you are at a lake or at a river, just have a look at them. Um, they are nice and um, in a variety of different shapes and forms. And if you dig a little bit deeper into that, you will see they are really, really beautiful. And hopefully they can help us. So um, learning from Mother Nature, that's what I started 24 years ago already. Um, and we, I screened a lot of these macrophytes. Um, so I was concentrating on aquatic macrophytes, normally submerged ones, and uh, looked what they can do. Um, and as an example, I show you here a graphic with diclofenac. Diclofenac is a painkiller. Um, as you all know, it's freely available in, uh, in drug markets, so you can use it. And I was just testing the uptake of this chemical into aquatic plants. Just see how much an aquatic plant can take up. And as humans are different, also plants are different. And you can see, for example, that some plants are really good and taking up this substance, and some other plants are not so good in doing that. But if we change the chemical, the clefinac, to maybe copper or maybe uh, cyanobacterial toxins or a pesticide, this pattern will change drastically. So what we did 24 years and even now, we screened 165 different macrophyte species and they were tested in single species test setup, which you can see a little bit on the left-hand side with the beakers. We tested them with 10 different cyanobacterial toxins, 12 different pesticides, six different polyaromatic hydrocarbons, four different polychlorinated biphenols and 12 different pharmaceuticals amongst human and veterinary of them. And then we, of course, mixed also these chemicals and tested them again so that we have uh, an overview of what is the potential of these pretty simple aquatic plants. So these are the setups, for example, and excuse the German writing, that's a picture from my German lab in the TU Berlin. So this is how it looks like. And uh, we, of course, not only tested the uptake of the chemicals, we looked at the photosynthesis of the plant, we looked at chlorophyll patterns, we looked at biotransformation enzymes, at oxidative stress enzymes. So a whole range of information, what a plant can do and what a plant may also suffer when it comes in contact with these contaminants. So with all these database, and uh, remember I was in former times at the Technical University of Berlin, so we were always seeking on what can we do with all this knowledge. And um, that, that was very nice because I was thinking on ecotoxicology should move into being an applied ecotoxicology. So not only monitoring a status of a water body and complaining, but delivering solutions. And uh, I was looking at the plants itself. So we were looking at the bioremediation potential of the coontail, Serratum pilum demersum, for example, with this pretty complex toxin, which you can see right uh, side, that's a microcystin LR produced by microcystis arevinosa, a blue-green algae. Um, and we can, when we expose the coontail with this toxin, we can bioremediate 70% of this toxin from the water body. Um, with Elodea canadensis, a very common uh, water plant as well, we get 62%, so very close to, to them. And with Muriophyllum spicatum, another one of these aquatic macrophytes, we only have 34%. So not, not something where we think on, okay, this, this is, is a good result. Um, it's a start, but not the optimal. So that's an exposure from one to four days. So the idea was then to combine the plants, to see what they can do if they are working together. So we build up these mother of green liver systems, um, very, very simple. Um, and uh, you can see it's compartmented. So we have compartments for every plant. And then we have uh, yeah, space for the water to meander through this uh, tank, just to control also the flow rate uh, in this system. Then we put the three plants in and we made the experiments again with these toxins. And you can see the difference. The difference is after four days, 100% of this toxin 
was not in the water anymore. It doesn't disappear. Yeah, it's still there, but we shift it from the water compartment into the plant compartment. And with that, the water is much more usable for the people, for the people. And of course, we have to take precautions that the plants, which are then contaminated with these toxins, are not eaten up by some other animals or are not used uh, in, in a way where these contaminants can be set free again. So we tested different systems. We scaled up the systems in the lab. These are some uh, which we built up uh, at the TU Berlin. We also experimented from my time in China with these Chinese rice field system, having water dropping from one level to another one, just to enhance the oxygen content uh, and to see how this will influence the bioremediation potential of these big systems we have. Um, then when we were pretty sure it was working, I was seeking out um, to someone who can really do a proof of concept and proof of concept is always you deliver the whole information to this person and then this person is building up this um, system in their own way, um, testing it and uh, seeing whether the idea you have is really working out. And Professor Tim Downing and his lab from the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University in Port Elizabeth, he was agreeing to do that for us. And um, we delivered all the data, all the information to him. And he was building up his own green liver system, uh, a little bit different from the style we have. So the water is, is just flowing uh, at the very bottom of this tank. And then he put the plants in, put the toxins in, and the result was pretty much the same. Four days and the toxin were um, removed or were shifted from the water body into the plants. So thanks for that, Tim. That was really great work and helps a lot for that. So with these ideas, we build up this green biotechnology or green technology using this ecosystem service, which are plant obviously providing. And I, I see plants, meanwhile, as my tools and as a toolbox. So if, if anyone comes to my lab and says, oh, Stefan, I have a problem with this and that in my water body. Can you help out with that? I, I probably will say after testing the water by myself, I will probably say, yeah, I can. And then I will pack my toolbox. And my toolbox are not hammers, screwdrivers, or saws. They are plants. And with these plants, I can maybe help in purifying the water body. So aquatic plants as tools. Um, I would like to showcase you some of the, the projects I was doing around the world. And let's start with the toolbox uh, going to China. I was working there for quite a bit at uh, Chao Hu. That's the fifth biggest lake in China. And that's a picture in the background from a good day. Um, it's completely um, green with blue-green algae. The smell is not very pleasant, and uh, you see also the kind of uh, dust and air pollution which is around. So we built up a project which was kindly financed by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany. And you have to know that Chao Hu is uh, used as a drinking water source for aquaculture, for agriculture, and also for recreation. And then please think about just putting on your bathing suit and jumping into this green water. Would you really do that? Probably not. So this little picture here shows um, the drinking water. That's after the drinking water preparation uh, of the city, after. So that's not a big difference with what you see in the lake. And that's because some of the cyanobacterial cells, they survive the process and it's, in that time, it was only potassium permanganate to oxidize everything which is in the water. And they survive and then they build up again um, in, this, in this tank, in this open air tank, uh, blooming again. And this water is then distributed to the city of Hefei, um, leading to a cancer rate of two persons per family. So the microcystins in general, they are liver toxins and they are making your cancer and the result can be seen in, in studies on their populations. So what to do? The Chinese government, uh, after we published it, the results from the lab, they asked me to build up this system a little bit bigger as a test plant. 
And we did this in the back, uh, this round-shaped building, that's the water treatment plant of Hefei. And uh, yeah, we built this up uh, with very, very simple means. The total cost of that were less than $500, um, just a little bit of wood digging out the place. And then we put in the plant. Um, we had during that time an electrical pump pumping in the water from the lake. And we had people helping us maintaining the system during the years which we had for this project. So that's the result. Um, we had the lake water, and when we tested the lake water, we had a microcystin content of 46.5 microgram, which is toxic. I would not recommend to drink it at all. After our system, you see already the change in the color of the water. Um, and when we test the water with our LCMS MS systems, then you have a toxin content of less than 0 0.5 microgram per liter. The WHO guideline for this toxin is one microgram per liter. If a water having that inside, it's safe to drink. I would not really agree to that, but I would say water without toxin would be best. But as you can see, the system is well below the WHO guideline for this toxin. I would also not recommend to immediately drink the water from this uh, Elmayer flask. Um, there are a lot of coliformy bacteria inside, so you need to have it through the normal process on oxidation or oxidation uh, until it's really ready for delivered to people for drinking. Another project we had is in El Alto. El Alto is in Bolivia, and what you see here is the drinking water from them. So that's where they get the drinking water from. There's no further treatment. It's just pumped into the city, and you can just get it from the tap. So El Alto is a former mining area. It suffers a lot of droughts at the moment. Um, it has heavy metals around because of the mining, and everything is uh, accumulating in the soil, in the water on that. So what we did is I went there with uh, my students, with a group of students, and we started um, to say, oh, we can build up a green liver system and we can help you and rescue you for these toxic components. And the adults were, okay, fine, no time. We have to feed our family. We have to go to the mines. We have to work. So they were not at all interested in that. So then I remember what my, what my, uh, yeah, kindergarten teacher told me always, uh, and she said, if we go to the kids, um, the kids will transfer these ideas to the parents at home. So what we did is we spent a decent amount of time in El Alto at the marketplace, and we played around with plastic bottles, with plants, with straws from a company, which you all know with the yellow M. Um, so we, we built up little tabletop plant uh, green liver systems for the kids. We explained them water cycles um, and uh, we did uh, environmental education at the marketplace. And with that, then the parents were approaching us again and said, okay, listen, um, there's a kindergarten and just build up a little system for them and then we see how it works. And this is exactly what we did in the upper pictures. There's the kindergarten in the back, and then we build up a system using the scary rainwater um, and just some flask where we had plants, um, and then these plants were purifying the water. But I also have to say we are also only using plants which are local. We are not transferring plants from one country to another one. So that's are all plants which are uh, local to this area we are working on. So the result, we have learned a lot on the needs of the community. Um, we had environmental education components, which was cool for my students to do that. And we had students' involvement from our country and also from Bolivia, from El Alto. As you can see from the table, um, the reduction in heavy metal contamination, we were looking at lead, mercury, and arsenic. It was, it was good. It was not perfect. And of course, these systems now have to be optimized and to see whether we can, with different combinations in, in plants, uh, whether we can get these uh, heavy metal load even more reduced on that. Yeah, the other project I would like to mention is Brazil. Um, this is uh, Itacuruba uh, and the Itabarica uh, Reservoir in there. And it's used 
again, for recreation and also for tilapia farming, drinking water production. And uh, the tilapia farming is polluting the water with nutrients, with, uh, with pharmaceuticals. And the way to maybe avoid that was just to build a, a, a clean liver system. We had a, a tilapia farm, which uh, was really uh, cooperating with us um, on that. And again, it was a, a project financed by our ministry. So we were just building up these uh, green liver system. And it's at the moment, the biggest one, which we did, uh, 120 meters long, 25 meters wide. Um, a little bit more sophisticated, like in China. So we built brick walls that we can really walk on that, that we can take water samples within the system. And uh, this is how it looks like from uh, a little bit on top. So we used the drone flying around on that. In the left-hand corner, you see the land-based uh, tilapia rearing station. So there are a hundred thousand of fish in these little ponds. And then we just thought on, okay, we use hopefully no technical equipment like pumps. So we used natural slope to get the water from the top of this area to our system. And we built in a natural slope that the water runs slowly through our system and then ending up in the reservoir itself purified from what is coming from the tilapia farms, which are nutrients, which are uh, cyanobacterial toxins. Most of these ponds at the, at the top here they are completely green because the, the people feed the fish more than three times and uh, all these overfeed is contributing to the grow up of the cyanobacteria. And then of course we have pharmaceuticals like methyl testosterone and um, also oxytetracycline, which is uh, commonly used in aquaculture to keep fish healthy. Um, the clean lizard system operates since 2014, uh, has a purification capacity of 2,000 cubic meter water a day, and the purification success amongst all these toxins which we have from 85 to 95%. That's um, pretty good. Um, with uh, the microsystem LR, we have 100%. Um, with the other tools, we have a variety. So, 85, 90% uh, of that we can get rid of using the plants to help us with that. The fence you can see here around the green liver system, that's because keeping the animals away, we are working in this area, which is called the Catinga, that's the desert area in the north of Brazil. And uh, of course, if they see a water body, they immediately jump in and feed on the nice and uh, green plants in the water. So to keep the, the goats out of that, um, that's why we fenced the whole area on that. Um, another thing is a little bit of, yeah, starting dreaming and starting planning and developing ideas with my students. So we had, we had the idea of green liver goat space. Um, a, a system which is completely sealed and full of plants and um, helping the astronauts maintaining a good water quality on their way, maybe to Mars. Um, and also, you know, if you put light on plants, they produce oxygen. So that would be an add on for astronauts to uh, have in their space shuttles and their spaceships. So we developed these ideas and this is the, the group we did this, um, all my students. And then we had really the luck that Ed Mitchell, this is the person in the middle of these slides, and he was the last man on the moon. Ed Mitchell was visiting Nordvik, ESA, um, the European Space Agency. And I took all my students in three buses and we went there immediately and talked with him. And I was amazing. The knowledge he has and the perspectives. And then he, he said, you know, uh, looking from, from space on Earth, um, that's, that's perfect. But seeing the colleague going to the toilet, you know that what he is doing there will be your coffee water on the next day. Because they have to recycle the water, obviously. And of course, they can't take uh, water for the whole trip with them. So there's a water recycling system. And he told us after nearly one day, the water was tasting like urine. And that, of course, makes the whole thing a little bit not so pleasant like it is. And we discussed the idea of this green liver system with him. And um, of course, 
Um, there's a there's a lot of things um, where we have to be careful that the water is not getting out of these boxes and um, so a lot of things to plan further ahead how we can achieve that. Um, within another project I had with the summer university at the Technical University of Berlin, so we invite people from all over the world to to work with us for four weeks. And uh, I had one one person um, from uh, Venezuela, and she sent me these pictures. Uh, that's the picture from her kitchen, and her mother is just filling a cup of drinking water. Um, and she said they have to filter, of course, this water, and this is how the drinking water is looking like. Mineral water is very expensive, um, so they they use this for cooking and for washing and for what they are doing. So we said we dedicate this summer university project to them and we build up a fridge size green liver system, an indoor system with artificial lights, which we can use for purification of these kind of water at home, at the kitchen, uh, under your own control. So that we end up with, with these devices, which you can see on the left side. So we did all the planning together with the students. We, we, we make plans, we go shopping, um, we, we build all these by ourselves. And then uh, we tested it, of course, and it was it was working quite well. We, we used diclofenac as a test substance and we, we uh, get rid of them with 85%. So the drinking water is at the bottom of the system. Um, another thing we had, I was working a long time in Africa and seeing all that the water bodies are not in a very good shape. So we, we are thinking on what can we do and we developed this mobile green liver system built in a, in a truck. This is a Mercedes Cetras truck. By the way, Mercedes Cetras trucks are rocket launchers. So you can see how you can use these vehicles e even for, for peaceful things like water purification. I had a group of students working two years with me on that, and we built up this model system. It was fully functioning with a fully functioning water cycle system. So in that little uh, one to 10 model, we could purify 50 milliliters of contaminated water per day. And if we calculate and scale this up, that would mean 500 liters per day. And that's sufficient to keep a small African community uh, with good water until they drill um, uh, water from, from groundwater sources to have um, good water or to build up a big green liver system at the lake um, to purify the water. So this was a joint venture, and for this project, I employed also a car mechanics because we have to know where we can place heavy loads on a truck. Um, and uh, this part in front was, for example, 3D printed in, in UK with a 3D scanner. We scanned in a little model we got from Mercedes. And then this uh, uh, woman was printing us the front part, and the, the back part was, was custom made by our students in the lab and um, yeah, tested on that. We were three times in television with that because everything was working and it was quite fun also for the students to be part of that. Um, I love to think out of the box and um, here comes Susanne Lawrence, it's a friend of mine and she's combining, or she's, she's an artist and we combined the ideas of green liver with environmental science and she was developing this idea of this environmental safety ring to purify water and have fun. So in the middle is a swimming pool for people. And then in the outside is my green liver system purifying the water for the swimming pool. And of course, when people swim in water, sometimes it's not fast enough to get out on a toilet. So they, they leave the urine inside that. And we have to purify that in a second green liver ring in this system to uh, get this urine out of that and not to pollute the environment even more. So that's a system uh, combining art and environmental science on that. Um, as I'm, I'm a big sushi fan, I was thinking on what can we do to um, keep the fjords of uh, Norway and uh, uh, other countries in a good shape. And we were developing an idea using also marine plants. And in that case, it would be marine macroalgae. And uh, we developed these ideas of an algae curtain around an aquacultural ring where they uh, rear up and grow salmon, for example, for salmon farming. 
and uh, to purify with these macroalgae the pharmaceuticals which are again used um, in these systems. We run the test in the lab with the macroalgae taking up pharmaceuticals, for example, and uh, this is the, the idea we developed. Um, it's uh, yeah, still under process on that side. Another threat for our aquatic ecosystems, and you all know about that, is plastic and microplastic. And it comes, as you can see, in different shapes and types and uh, sizes. And um, if we are looking at that, I was thinking, how can we do something against that? You know, to get out a water bottle or big plastic pieces from, from the ocean and from water, that's not really rocket science. You can design fancy boats and just filter them out. That's perfect, but what to do with the things you hardly can see, the microplastic, which is smaller than five millimeters or nanoplastic, which is even smaller than that. And I was thinking on plant. Plant can do that, but plants can't take up the plastic. That's impossible. Um, there's no pores are big enough to do that. And then I was thinking on how about gills? Gills are filtering oxygen out of water. That's how a fish gets the oxygen. And I was thinking, can I use this idea of gills and use plant materials to construct a plant gill system? Filtering these nano and micro microplastic out of water using plant materials. And for that, uh, I was thinking on using uh, dead plant materials and uh, also recycled ones, so coconut shells, these uh, loofah, this uh, cucumber stuff, uh, old t-shirts from cotton uh, to have this recycling idea in mind and old coffee bags. As I'm a coffee addict, or I was a coffee addict, these coffee bags would be of course something uh, to, to use in this system. So what we did is we constructed uh, columns and we have uh, fluorescent labeled microplastic. Um, we, uh, had these materials in these columns, we put the plastic on top and then we run it uh, through that with, with water. And as you can see from the table, with some of these plastics, we are pretty good in uh, removing 100% uh, already from uh, polyethylene plastics um, in this kind of a system using dead plant material. Um, so we expanded this ecosystem service of plants and this green technology, what plants can do for us. And in that case, coconut is not an aquatic plant, forgive me for that, also the others. But we can expand the service which plants in general are delivering in helping us keep the environment in a good shape. With that, I would love to tell you my dream. Um, and my dream is, and I have a dream, and I hope I am allowed to use these big words, I have a dream of urban sustainable living. So to transform our cities to a place where we have urban green spaces, which are safe for our kids and for ourselves to recreate, um, where we can have safe urban farming to keep transport ways short, um, where we have even maybe urban aquaculture in water bodies in the cities, and then we clean up the water with green liver systems and plant gill systems, um, and then see how this will work out on that. So that's a little bit of my dream um, on that. Um, as you can see on the pictures here, um, it's nice to have a dream, but it's even more nice to share this dream with young people. And that's what we, what I did. Um, and I'm grateful to have to have this opportunity to work with them all. And then we had quite a fun and that's that's what it is. It should be always fun working together and developing ideas. And this is why it is important to have research coupled with teaching and to put the kids and the students immediately into research and developing ideas instead of yeah, keeping them in the lecture hall. I thanks a lot to my CSI team which you can see here. And I also thank you a lot for your attention on that. And I'm happy to take questions on the lecture on this. So I stop sharing my screen now, hope that's okay. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was very interesting. You, you've shown us that picture before of your CSI team. That's a big team. A lot of students yeah. and researchers who are part of that, that, uh, 
that go into that. So, and and we've received a few comments in Slido about what a beautiful dream that is, and and uh, and thanks for sharing that. So, why don't we go to some of our questions on Slido? I'm not sure if there's any on YouTube. So, um, here we go. Okay, I think we need to make it just a little bigger if it's at all possible. Teddy, having a hard time seeing. Um, okay, just. One moment. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, this this question came in earlier, which is why is water not a commodity? Nestle profits by it. Mm -hmm. If you're able to yeah. share on that. Um, as you as you see from my presentation, I think we all have to take care on water, and then we will all profit on that. And um, it's it's Nestle. It's other companies. And if we can convince other companies to invest in our green technology and to help, then we will profit all of that. So um, it, it's it's very easy all the time to pick on a special company, but we should we should, we are all responsible for that. I'm responsible to have good water, um, and uh, I have also to think on what what I'm flushing down the toilet, uh, having rest of medications, um, having um, yeah things which I don't use anymore, like uh, sanitizers or whatever. So we have to start with us and then to convince the others. And it will be just a snowball getting bigger and bigger for the safe of our water and keeping our water bodies in a good shape. Mm -hmm. I think, th thank you for that feedback. I think you're right. It, it, it takes all of us, right, to make sure that our water is is safe and pure uh, everywhere. So that that's a, yeah. that's a great tip. Uh, Teddy, if you want to bring back Slido. Um, okay, I think, I don't know if there's maybe a question further above, if you can go scroll further above, because we see that's a beautiful dream. Um, I'm just, okay, I'm just going to grab, never mind, I'm going to grab this one. How can water use licensing be, how, how can, <laughs> oops, okay, a lot of things have come through. Um, how can water use licensing be improved? I think, you know, personally, um, I think water is too cheap. Um, if you look at Germany, we pay a half of a euro cent for water. And that's really too cheap that people start thinking on the use of water because half of a euro cent, come on, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so we have to improve that. And uh, with, with these, um, we, we have more possibilities to, to think about what we can do with, with this money to improve water quality for all mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I know people don't want to hear that, but, but really, um, if you think on what you're paying for one liter of fuel in comparison to one liter of water, and if you think about, if I put you in a room with one liter of fuel and one mm -hmm. liter of water, and I keep you there for four days, if you drink the fuel, you will die soon. If you drink the liter of water and you make it over these three days, you will survive. So it's just a matter of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's a great analogy. Um, there's a question that's coming through YouTube. And that is, which plants in, are, in, I guess, are indigenous to Canada have you experimented on for... I'm not even going to try to say that word. Um, have you tried tried wild rice? Um, no, uh, I would not even I would not even take wild rice for that, um, oh. because because you know rice is is something which goes very quickly and wild rice goes very quickly into the food chain, so that's not what we want. We also want to have plants which are submerged into the water. Our system is completely artificial. It has nothing to do with a wetland, with a constructed wetland. So we try to avoid rooted plants um, mm -hmm. to, minim to minimize bacterial growth and to minimize bacterial metabolism and that. Because bacteria metabolize outside of their cells and I want that most of the contaminants are metabolized in the plant. That's the difference and that's why I would not take wild rice. Even the reed uh, in the Chinese, um, in the Chinese uh, uh, example I give you, I was not so happy about that. But the Chinese government was telling me, "Okay, please use reed," and so I was using it for that. Okay, all right. No, that's a great explanation. Um, okay, a question that came in through YouTube, and that is, sorry if I missed this, but which plants can be used 
uh, for green liver systems here in Manitoba. When I, you know, I'm since a year here already, and uh, I was sometimes at the lakes uh, here, and I see that you have Ceratophyllum demersum, you have Muriophyllum spicatum, you have Allodea canadensis. So there are plants which are all over the world, um, and this can be used. What I said, we use only local plants. I will mm -hmm. not transfer a South American plant, even if it would be the best in the world for doing the remediation process to Canada or vice versa, because that's not what we want. We want to use the natural resources of the location to do the purpose. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Teddy, we're gonna go back to Slido now. There's a number of questions here. Um, okay, how does this compare to nature-based or natural infrastructure solutions? If if you mean with that constructed wetlands, um, then I have to say our system is packing away the contaminants into the plant, so completely shifting it into that. We still produce because you can't avoid microbiology in these systems, uh, but you can minimize that. Um, so when you when you for example have microcystin and you put it in a wetland system, we get around twenty different metabolites in the water in the water and we don't know the toxicity of these metabolites. If we put these in our green liver system, we get maybe four or five metabolites in the water, um, which is significantly less. And with that, maybe also the water is uh, less um, yeah, dangerous or toxic to that. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's why we, we prefer really artificial systems instead of really um, getting into this wetland. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna. There's a few questions that have come through on Slido in a similar theme, and it's applicable to our own water in the city of Winnipeg and and uh, and Manitoba. So, um, okay. So one is how pure and safe is the water in Winnipeg? Should we be drinking bottled water? That's a good idea. Um, uh, uh, not a good idea. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> You know, for, for me, coming from Europe, when I was opening the tap and smelling the chlorine, um, I have my issues with that. Um, I'm not used to that because we use oscillation in Europe. So that's, uh, you can't smell anything on that. Um, I know and I learned um, that some of the regions here in Manitoba, they have a water boiling act, which is for first yeah. world country, really something they have to get rid of immediately. So they have to work on that. Um, how to provide safe water to these communities. That, that would be number one. Um, because if you have a water boiling act somewhere else, it, it, yeah, but in Canada, first world, come on. We can do better, I think. Okay, there's some more questions that back to Slido that I just went, but there was a question that was earlier on, uh, Ted, if you're able to bring back Slido, and it is, ah, yes, that one. So how large of a green liver can be made? Uh, could the city of Winnipeg implement this? Um, we, we have this Chinese project in, in Hefei, um, they build up a green liver system three times big as a football field and they're serving fresh water or purified water for 5 million people. Okay. Um, there's a question on YouTube. I'm gonna go to YouTube now. Um, interesting question. It says, you say water is currently cheap. I understand your point, but do we want to make it elitist by charging more and marginalizing vulnerable people? That's a that's a good point, and I'm I'm really thankful for that. Um, I think people who can pay have to do what they can do to make good water for all of us. Um, and of course, that's that's with time it will equalize that, and then it will be um, again cheap for all of us. And that's the point. Um, at the moment, what are people doing here? They are buying bottled water. Is that the solution? I think not. Bottled water is not also the cheapest thing in the world. So we we have to see that we can do a common effort that people who can pay more do pay more um, to help out the people who can't do that and to equalize this a little bit. But it's a good question and I'm, I'm happy that you brought this up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, back to Slido. 
Um, okay, so speaking about your dream, what kind of costs are associated with this dream? <laughs> that's that's a question I always receive. How how much does this cost? How much? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I tell you, um, if I compare the costs with, for example, a reverse osmosis uh, or with active carbon, the costs are a tenth of that. Um, because the plants are growing by themselves. Of course, mm -hmm. we have to we have to remove from time to time plants to restock the plant in the system. Um, and then to think about what we can do with the contaminated plants um, in a safe way. Um, that's another issue we can talk about. Um, but, but this is uh, much, much cheaper. So 500, 500 bucks for the Chinese system, the Brazilian system, which is rather big, was in total with the machines and all this and the, the fuel we had for the machines was around maybe $5,000 in total and running and the running costs, this is what, what comes. So the building cost is one part and then the running costs you yeah. have, the operating mm -hmm. costs. And uh, these are much, much less than um, with an, yeah reverse osmosis or changing active carbon filters every week. Hmm. Okay, good to know. Um, there's a few questions on Slido that I realized that we haven't been able to get to for a little while. Um, Okay, is there any potential for this to be applied to eutrophic lakes to treat the entire water body? Mm, yeah, uh, if I would have um, at least half a day with you um, <laughs> and more time, and I'm complaining that I only have this short amount of time, um, then I could show you um, uh, examples which we did in Guatemala um, uh, at Lake Atilan. And this is a highly eutrophic lake, and um, we were thinking on how can we help the whole lake, whole lake experiments. Um, and the idea was building up green liver islands, which are floating in the lake, purifying mm -hmm. the water, uh, having a green liver belt around the lake shore to purify the water. So there are ideas around. Um, we are testing, we are yeah, producing ideas and, and uh, see how we can uh, flip a lake into a a good shape again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's one last question, a slide that I just wanted to to peek at, and that was, uh, how, how often do you have to replace your plants with this system? Yeah, um, that's that's also a very good question, and it depends very much on the amount of contamination we have to remove from the water body constantly. So the concentration of these contaminants, the amount of concentrations, that's that's what we are looking at, and plants have they grow and with that they can really take up a lot, but there's a limit um, when, they, when they can't do it anymore, then we have to remove it. Um, and the long time test shows it's maybe after five to six months, we have in parts, remove some plants and plant new ones in to keep the, the system in a good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now back to YouTube, we've got lots of great questions sitting there. One of which is, can the system be used up north in winter for remote communities? Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, as you know, I changed from, uh, from uh, the Technical University of Berlin um, in Germany to Finland. And Finland is known as being a cold country and I was First of all, it was my own test whether I can stand cold weather before coming to Canada. <laughs> before coming here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the second one was, of course, having in mind what can we do um, to build up a green liver system in this kind of a cold and snowy area. And I, I tell you, Finland in winter is even more dark, so plants mm -hmm. would have a problem to get enough light. Um, so that's where we came up with greenhouse systems, which are then... Um, yeah, we use thermal energy to keep that warm, um, to keep that at a, at a temperature where the plants are still working and living and to have uh, uh, artificial LED lights to, to keep them to make photosynthesis and to help us producing or um, kind of, uh, purifying the water. So there are possibilities even in really cold weather to do that. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. We have, we still have so many more questions to go through, but I'm going to maybe just limit it to two more because I see that we're at time. Um, okay. Back onto YouTube. So um, is any groundwater okay to drink in Manitoba where it doesn't have to be boiled if not treated? As, as I said, I can't answer this question honestly okay. because I don't know it. Um, normally, I would say test the water, see what's mm -hmm. inside and see whether it's safe or not to drink. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, this might be in a similar vein, but so how about systems for individual households like rural holdings? How long before this could be a reality? And it says for the, this above question referring to green livers for reusing household water. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see that. That's part of the dream of a sustainable urban city. Um, and uh, one step in that direction was the system we designed for Venezuela, having it in your own kitchen and being responsible for that. You know, you, you have to check, you have to learn how to keep the plants healthy, how to see if the plants are not feeling well. And then having a checklist and an SOP manual what to do if a plant is not feeling well, when to remove it, and uh, what to do with the contaminated plants after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the last uh, question from YouTube that we're going to look at it because it's about solar aquatic systems. So they thank you for your talk. Do you have any experience with solar aquatic systems? Are there major differences to the green liver system? Um, so that means using uh, solar energy just to, to purify water um, on, on that, this is, I guess, what, what is meant on that. Um, I, ha I would have to look it up. You know, you ha we have to understand, and that's what I had to learn in former times as well when we developed these, these systems. None of these systems is maybe m making the work at all good. So we have maybe to combine systems. We have to see what we can do in, in, in testing out green liver system with these solar systems, with even maybe using sand filters and active carbon when it's really necessary. And the combination of all these systems in a good way will help us keep our waters in a good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it at that. There's still some more questions that have come through. So, uh, Stephanie, if you're okay, I might just forward those questions to you. And if you feel that you're able to answer them, perhaps if you could give us a few uh, points on that, and then we can share it with our uh, with our larger audience. But some really interesting ones about what you do with your plants and uh, actually forwarding an article about something to, to do with removing microplastics from water. So I'll share that with you. So uh, thank you so very much for that really interesting presentation. And as you can imagine, with the level of questions we've had, our audience has also found it very interesting. I think we can all say that clean drinking water for everywhere around the world is really, really important to us. And so your research is groundbreaking and, and please keep doing that here at the University of Manitoba and all over the world. So thank you everybody for participating wherever you are joining us. We did have a question from someone. Yes, we're recording this. Yes, it will be posted on our website and we will share that with you. So if you wanted to see any of those slides again, um, uh, feel free to do that. Please watch it again and again, share with your network. Uh, I just want to let you give, give you a sneak peek as to what is next week. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're really excited. This is our climate series. So you'll notice that all the sessions over the six weeks have a climate focus on them today being on water. Uh, and all of the researchers are from uh, the Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. So that's really exciting. So next week, if you haven't registered for it yet, I encourage you to do that on our website. We will have with us Dr. Michelle McChrystal. She's a postdoctoral fellow from the Center for Earth Observation Science with the Department of Environment and Geography in the faculty, in which I just mentioned. And again, on uh, uh, on moisture, on, on, on that topic, a wetter future for the Arctic. I'm sure a lot of us are very interested in the future of the Arctic as we see more and more. And we have some of uh, the world-renowned scientists here at our university, University of Manitoba. So you won't want to miss that one. So please go to our website to register for that. Thank you for your time today. Please watch this again and again, and we will see you next week.